Hello, I'm Holly Lindley, and I'm here with Doug Tyson and Stephen Miller. They are both extraordinary high school mathematics teachers, and they are on the joint committee from the NCTM, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, and the American Statistical Association for K-12 Statistics Education. And I'm here today to ask them a few questions. So, first of all, Doug and Stephen, will you tell me a little bit about where you teach and your experience? Yeah, I teach in Central York High School in York, Pennsylvania. I've taught for 25 years, and I like to say I used to be a math teacher, and now I'm a statistics teacher. Okay. Because my entire schedule is now statistics oh, of great. some sort or another. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I couldn't be happier. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. I teach at Winchester Thurston School in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I started teaching in the 1994-95 school year. So that would be, what, 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. I took a few years off to get my master's in statistics and worked in the corporate world, but the, the allure of teaching was too strong and I had to go back. So I went back to, back to teaching. I teach statistics and physics. I've taught calculus. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, we're glad you're back in the classroom. <laughs> I am too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, you know, as math teachers, we, we get the privilege. So you know, even though statistics is a heavy part of your curriculum, not all teachers get to teach just statistics all day long. So, you know, we get the privilege of teaching students all types of content in our curriculum. So if you think about kind of your, your planning and you're trying to choose the tasks that you want to put in front of students, what are some of the key features of those tasks that you think about, that, would, that you think would engage students in statistical investigations and having opportunities to think um, about making claims and inferences? I think the most important thing for me is to ask good questions. In fact, uh, that's a phrase from Alan Rossman. He's, mm -hmm. he's one of the great stats educators in the country. Um, but I think, I think I would go a step further. I think you need to ask the right questions and that's an mm -hmm. allusion to the idea um, from Erdish, Paul Erdish who said you know he thinks there's this book of perfect math proofs that exists and our goal is to try and discover it. Well I think there's this set of perfect questions you can ask a student mm -hmm. that would get them to develop statistics in their own head for themselves okay. and so that's what I'm always thinking about what's the perfect question to ask in this situation mm -hmm. to get students to understand what I want them to understand. Okay, good. And I, I agree with all that, and I would like to add that I think the questions need to be relevant and recent, mm -hmm. something that the students would be interested in. Yeah. Um, just because I'm interested at age 50 doesn't mm -hmm. mean that a 16 or 18 year old would be at all interested. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. So finding things that are relevant mm -hmm. to our, their world around them and um, that are age appropriate, for, right. you know, context that they can um, um, grapple with and make sense of. And something current. Right. You know, what's happening in right. the news now or, or in the last year or so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So w when so I'm just want to just want to follow up with a little bit with that. So when you're when you're trying to think about current events and um, uh, what's happening in the world around them. Do you go out and look for specific data sources that are related to those events, or how do you do, how do, you do that? You want to start? A lot of it, I think, comes from reading the newspaper and okay. finding things. And then if there's something that really piques my interest and that I mm -hmm. think would be relevant, then I start digging for the data. Okay. Sometimes I can find it, sometimes I can't. And yeah. It takes takes a lot of time to mm -hmm. find yeah, good no, data I agree. Mm -hmm. and that, that it can be frustrating because I know it's got to be there somewhere right mm -hmm. right and sometimes when you right. download it even mm -hmm. if you do find it you have to put it in a form that is going to be right. usable by your students right. right and I would say in both directions sometimes mm -hmm. I see the the story the event the thing mm -hmm. and then I go to find the data and sometimes um, and I do that because I know it'll interest students. Yeah. And then other times, you, you just sort of stumble across data, and you and you think in reverse and go, oh, wow. I think that might be interesting to students. Mm -hmm. So I think it happens both ways. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I would mm -hmm. agree with that. Right. So. so when you're in your classroom and you're trying to kind of scaffold and build up your student's ability to do inferential reasoning, how do you think about that as far as a sequence of tasks or sequ sequence of experiences that you give them? A lot of it, I think, for me, has to do with kind of where in the curriculum are we, mm -hmm. and you know, can I take them a little bit farther? You know, do we have more with probability theory? Can I, can yeah. I get a little further with mm -hmm. it? 
um, and ask questions like, you know, what are the chances of seeing results like this, or at least as extreme as this, right. you know, if this claim is true. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so a lot of it's gauged in where in the curriculum I am. And I also like to, if I just happen to have kind of a class period, mm -hmm. you know, I'll pull something out just to, just to play. Yeah. You know, maybe, it, maybe it's something that we did earlier in the year, or maybe it's something um, that can foreshadow something to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how do you set your students up so that they um, get in the habit of backing up their claims? Like when they're making an inference, what do you really want them to, um, to use as evidence for those inferences? So the probability value, the p-value, mm -hmm. is is the classic, mm -hmm. you know, uh, evidence that we provide. Yeah. As as you know, evidence against the null. So when I do my activities from day one with smelling Parkinson's or for, or later in the year, a lot of them are simulations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we make dot plots with stickers, mm -hmm. and you can buy those at any office supply yeah. store. Yeah. Yeah. And what we what I do is I have them use um, one color of dot and a second color, usually red, for the, the what would be the p-value. Mm -hmm. And so I try and tie all of that back together. We start, you know, shading tails, even though they don't know that, right. um, from day one. And so I guess um, I keep, it, it's, it's, you keep feeding back into the question. The key question is, would, would this be reasonable to happen by chance? Yeah. And <laughs> if you start with that, you can, you can weave that in through the entire mm -hmm. course would it be reasonable to happen by chance? Would it be reasonable to happen by chance? Right. And, and so that's the decision-making criteria. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you get to the point where you feel it'd be unreasonable, oh, oh, well, then that means some claim that we thought was true might not be true now. Right. right. And so I think that's how you tie all of that together. Yeah. Now you, I use that phrase, would it be reasonable mm -hmm. to, for this to happen by chance? I use that often. Mm -hmm. And another activity that I do just to get them thinking is I take, and I got this from Roxy Peck, I just mm -hmm. take a deck of cards mm -hmm. and, or a couple decks, and one deck is perfectly, you know, untouched, everything's fine with it. The other deck I've taken and replaced all the black cards with red cards. Uh -huh. So I've got to maybe leave a few black You've cards in there. You've got a stacked deck. I've got a stacked <laughs> deck, exactly. And I just start flipping cards over and say, okay, what do you think? I'm asking you about the fairness of this deck of cards. Yeah. And then I shove it back in, reshuffle, pull another one. Right. How long? How, how many draws? You know, how many reds in a row are you willing to accept before you start, you know, before you start questioning the fairness? Yeah. Yeah. And five often comes five. up as a number in my class. Five. <laughs> you get to about five, and they start to freak out a little right. bit. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I uh, a long time ago, I um, there was a company over in the UK um, called Highland Games, and they sold weighted die that mm -hmm. looked exactly like regular die. So mm. it wasn't that they had like two ones on, you know, on the die. It, right. it, it, it had all six, um, all, all six um, fa regular faces, but it was weighted inside so that oh. it would favor one. So you couldn't tell by inspection right. yeah, what yeah. it would look. A and I mix those up with regular die and have them explore them. And, you know, it, it breaks their assumptions mm -hmm. of, of course right. a die is fair. It has all six sides. <laughs> you know? We had our I had our STEM coordinator make me a few weighted dice. Yeah, I think now with three D printed. I was exactly going to say that nice. with three D printers now we should be able to uh, to do some of this. And so, you said you could weigh them so so it might be close to fair yeah. versus and or really far off from fair. Right. Right. Yeah. So since we're talking about these things, um, pennies. Uh -huh. So if you take a penny and flip, um, it'll it'll land heads up, tails up about 50% of the time. But if you take a penny and spin, mm -hmm. that won't necessarily happen. If you get right. pennies from the uh, 1960s, and you can buy them on eBay, by the way, I just bought two rolls for $8, including shipping the other day. Uh -huh. And if you spin them like this, can you see the tabletop? If you spin <laughs> them, put them on a tabletop and flick them or spin them so that it spins, yeah. um, they'll, on land, its axis. Yeah, yeah. they'll land uh, ten uh, tails up Anywhere from 70 to 95% of the time, uh -huh. tails up. And you can really mess with kids, which is great. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because after a few spins, mm -hmm. they start to look at you. Right, right. But I think that those are the experience that we mm -hmm. have to kind of shake that when you when you look at different objects and you make assumptions, sometimes those assumptions may not be true. And there are times when um, you actually have to collect data on something to actually, you know, 
from reason from the data about whether mm -hmm. or not something if you think was fair is it really fair right, right. You know? and um, and I think that really promotes the empirical approach I also really liked what you were saying before about depends on how far along we've been on probability you know mm -hmm. and that um, and the with both of you taking a simulation approach um, to all to thinking about inferential reasoning at the core they are building probability models mm -hmm. right. you know and they right. have they have to mm -hmm. um, be able to think about, you know, if this, if we're going to assume, could this happen by chance? Well, then, what is the model? What's the chance model that we're assuming mm -hmm. is true? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, uh, and then building from that. And I also loved hearing that you. It seems like you're starting with these hands-on experiences and getting the students, ex you know, experiences with that and collecting repeated samples. You know, right, that, right, that the right. um, the dot plot you were talking about is not just a dot plot of a single sample. Right. It's, you know, each dot is representing a proportion or whatever statistic we're collecting mm -hmm. mean um, from each sample. And it's, so mm -hmm. it's an empirical sampling distribution. Right. right. Yeah. And, um, and, I th and that's accessible to kids on day one. Yeah, it, it is. is. And in, for smelling Parkinson's in particular, I deal with counts. It's a binomial count. Mm -hmm. And so counts are easier than proportions right. to think through. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely.